thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I have to say I feel really privileged and humbled by being here uh, speaking on uh, for science on the screen, which is this really wonderful uh, series that you have. I have to say, Philistine that I am, that I was not aware of science on the screen uh, before uh, being asked to, uh, to participate. Uh, but I certainly will be paying attention in the future. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, greatly aware of it, you can go on the Coolidge Corner website, as I did, and see the wonderful and interesting talks and pairings of talks and films that have gone on uh, over the years, and I certainly look forward to more in the future. So um, as Kathy uh, described, I'm going to talk uh, about environmental killers, environmental disease. Um, we will see a movie in which uh, one was tracked down in California, and I will also talk to you a bit uh, about one that we are working on in Central America. So uh, yes, the movie, Erin Brockovich. Uh, there really is a real Erin Brockovich. And when she was interviewed, she said that that movie is 98 to 99% accurate. Uh, so we can, uh, when you are looking at that, I think you don't have to worry too much about all the, that it's too hyped up uh, from a Hollywood standpoint. Uh, there are certainly a few things that are uh, left out that don't quite fit the, uh, the dramatic arc that well, but you can look those up on the internet. Uh, again, as Kathy said, so here's, uh, this was Hinckley, California. This is a town in the Mojave Desert, about 1,900 people, very small, obviously very small town, rural. Um, the, they had the misfortune of living in a town where also the Pacific Gas and Electric had a compressor station, which is needed for distribution of natural gas. Um, in that compressor station, there were certain chemicals that were used that were perhaps not handled uh, quite appropriately. And as a result, um, as uh, you will see, um, there was a great deal of devastation uh, to, that, to that community. Um, and uh, a really tremendous job by uh, the law firm um, in general, and uh, Aaron in particular, to really track that down. Um, now, in some ways, this is the story of one small cluster of cancers in uh, one small town. There were probably, I think there were about 60 families who were, who were involved. Um, and um, of course, but though the implications are much larger, the implications are um, that, first of all, people are exposed to the same chemical in other places, so this is the place where we found it, but certainly uh, many people are exposed in, in different places, both occupationally and uh, uh, environmentally. Um, but it also speaks to the broader question of you know, how do we live in a modern uh, society uh, and balance the needs of, uh, of health and safety you know, against those of profit. It also, what also strikes me about this movie is that this is the way I think in the United States that most of these environmental problems come to our attention. These, they tend to be clusters in one area, and then we can uh, expand our understanding of them. Um, they, they serve as a, a crystallized example, and then we can apply it more broadly. But Love Canal, Tom's River, Woburn, these are, these are generally the way that we learn about these kinds of environmental uh, factors. So now, imagine instead of one small town with, let me go back one, one chemical that was already known to be a carcinogen that they had to just find out about. Imagine now that you are in Central America where the scope of the disease is across all the countries from Guatemala down through Panama and where nobody knows what the cause of the disease is. This is a much bigger problem, uh, not to minimize what happened to the families there, but 
There have been about 20,000 deaths so far uh, due to this disease, and uh, it has not only devastated families, but it has devastated whole communities. What does it mean to lose uh, some, perhaps 20% uh, of your population to this disease. So uh, what does the media say about it? Well, you'll see this term mysterious a lot. Mysterious kidney disease. It is mysterious. It plagues Central America. Mysterious kidney disease slays farm workers in Central America. Deadly illness in Nicaragua baffles experts. So this is what we are starting with. Um, we are starting with very little information, and we have to put together that information, and we have to track, track that down. And um, again, all, uh, uh, all credit to uh, Aaron Brockovich, but uh, this is a, a tougher situation. The frustration, this has been going on for 20 years now, the fr and has been increasing over time. The frustration uh, certainly boils over. Uh, certainly there are demonstrations. It spills over into violence sometimes. Uh, to, uh, a week or two, I was in uh, Nicaragua and uh, was planning to visit where we do research and was not able to go there because of the violence that had, uh, that had uh, broken out in the, in the area. So uh, this is uh, something that really has caused a tremendous, tremendous problem throughout the, the region. So how do we start? How do we figure out what we're going to, what might be the cause of this? Well, f first we've got to start with what we call descriptive epidemiology. We need some basic clues. So where does the disease occur? Is it occurring throughout the country or is it concentrated in certain regions? Well, what we find is that this disease is along the Pacific lowlands and not uh, throughout throughout the rest of the country. So you don't see it in the mountainous areas down the, down the spine of these countries. You don't see it on the Atlantic side. So it's in one uh, specific area um, down that Pacific coast. Interesting. If we look at kidney disease in the United States, men and women are equally likely to develop the disease. So is that different in Central America? Yes. In Central America, um, men die at about uh, five times, oh, in the areas that are specific, especially affected, men are dying at five times the rate of women. Another clue. In the United States, the great majority of people with kidney disease are more than 60 years old. How does that compare to Central America? Well, here's a, uh, we're going to compare a survey that is done among residents in the United States to a survey that was done of the residents in Quetzalcoatl. This was a survey that was sponsored by and carried out by uh, members of the sister city uh, with, with uh, public health students. Uh, so if we look at ages 31 to 40, 13% in Nicaragua, 1% in the United States. 41 to 55, 28% in Nicaragua, in Quetzalcoatl, 3%. So this is a disease that is hitting men, and it's hitting them at a younger age. And these are men who are in their working age with young families. So if you look at this picture, which I took my first trip down, the irony, or the tragedy, of this picture is if somebody has chronic kidney disease in here, um, maybe you would think it was the mother, but it's the two sons who already have chronic kidney disease, can no longer work, and um, for many people, most people, there's very little treatment, uh, and it's eventually a death sentence. This is pretty fun, right, so far? Yeah. Um, we need, so, and then finally, are there any particular occupations that are affected? Um, well, the occupation that is most identified with this disease and um, where most people have been um, diagnosed is sugarcane. Now, partly that's because sugarcane is also just the biggest 
industry along this area. So part, part of it is that, but it is certainly a high risk um, occupation as well. So here you see a couple of the jobs that, that people in sugarcane do. The one on the left is, is a cane cutter. The one on the right is a, uh, a agrochemical a applicator. It's actually the cane cutters who, uh, although there's little data, hard data on it, it's the cane cutters that everyone acknowledges are most at risk for this disease. Now, if it was all in sugar cane, maybe that would be a little bit uh, easier for us to figure out uh, what is going on, but uh, we have some more clues. It's not only in sugar cane. Uh, we, it's among underground miners. It's among brick makers. It's among stevedores. And it's among fishermen. These are just the, the, the occupations that have been diagnosed. There's undoubtedly uh, many others. Um, but these are where the studies have been done. So we have to start thinking about these are the clues that we have. You know, what are the causes that are going to cause a disease that occurs primarily in the lowlands of the Pacific Coast, among men, uh, among those of younger ages, and in sugarcane and other agricultural workers, but not only those, other manual labor occupations. So then the next thing to do is to think about hypotheses that people have come, uh, and many people have uh, raised different hypotheses. I will give you uh, the, the ones that are more um, feasible, uh, likely. The, uh, some I have gotten from people in email who um, said that People ride to work uh, in these buses, and they're crowded. And rat, it's been shown that in rats, if you if you crowd them together, they get kidney disease. So maybe it's the crowded buses. Um, we filed that one. Um, but anyway, heat stress, dehydration, and muscle damage is one of the one of the main theories. The other uh, main theory that has been put forward is, of course, agrochemicals. It's a natural one to think about. Uh, infections is something we need to, to think about. Certain medications, and that could be either uh, anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, where, uh, which, but at least by anecdote, are widely used in the uh, region. And herbal medications are another concern. Metals, uh, particularly arsenic, is uh, well documented there, coming uh, predominantly from the volcanoes that, that uh, run down the spine of these countries. And then uh, uh, the possibility of a genetic uh, factor as well. So when we're thinking about all these things, we have to think about the potential for how likely is it that people are exposed? How likely it are these? is it that these uh, exposures could cause kidney disease, and how does it fit with the data that uh, we have described before? So for example, one of the uh, problems that we have had is that the uh, things that we know cause kidney disease aren't what people are exposed to. And the things that we know that people are exposed to aren't known to cause kidney disease. So we're dealing with something new here. We're dealing with um, not that the kidney disease itself is new, but there's something that's causing it that is different. So what do we do? We have to go ahead, we have to research. Um, and we have been fortunate to uh, work with a team in Nicaragua that is absolutely fabulous. Um, it's headed by Dr. Amador, who directed epidemiology for the Ministry of Health for uh, 20 years uh, before leaving. And then we were fortunate enough to, uh, for him to find us. And he has been uh, the head of our program. And his, his close, close collaborator, uh, Demars Lopez, has been um, uh, working with us that whole time. And they are really incredibly committed, incredibly dedicated. They could have a very nice, easy jobs, but they are out in the fields all the time. Um, they are fighting floods. Uh, I was told about that this last, uh, this last week. They almost got swept away in a, a flood um, with the, the heavy rains and, and so forth. And here are, and at the bottom are the other members of the, of the team. And uh, we really appreciate their work. 
So we have been out there, we have been uh, investigating uh, among workers, among students, among patients in communities, including the community of Quetzalcoatl. We, we had, as I mentioned, we had gone to Quetzalcoatl in 2008. We went back there in 2015 to see what has happened to the people. We're looking at that data. So um, we're just trying to look at a whole range of things to try and narrow down this, this question. So, where do we stand? Do we know the answer? No, we don't, not yet. If I were gonna bet, this is what I would say. It's heat stress acting on a genetically susceptible population. Um, we have to think about heat stress. I mean, one, one question that always comes up about heat stress is, hey, it's hot everywhere or many places, why, why here? Maybe the genetically susceptible population makes that a little bit more, maybe explains why that would happen. The other question that gets asked is, why now as opposed to before if it's heat stress? People have been working hard at these sugarcane jobs for a long time and um, I think that the next slide will tell us a little bit about that. So could I be wrong? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not ruling out. We don't rule out things, but you know, we, we as the evidence accrues, uh, not just us, but uh, many people are starting to focus in on this heat stress idea. So just, just the fact of strenuous work in a hot climate, insufficient hydration, may be enough to cause kidney, uh, kidney disease. Now we know already that heat stress can cause your kidneys to stop working, right? The marathon runner, the, the high school kid who is practicing football and the coach is saying, you know, only wimps drink water during practice and then they, they collapse. Um, and, and other very uh, intensive, uh, during in intensive activities. But we're talking about something different. We're talking about something where people go every day and, may, and we're thinking that maybe it just chips and chips and chips away at their, at their kidneys until they no longer uh, can work. So why now? Well, the climate has been changing. Climate's been changing in Nicaragua. We just, we just had the good fortune to be able to look at data that have been collected uh, since 1973 on uh, the largest sugarcane uh, plantation in Nicaragua. They collected uh, temperature data every day since 1973. And you can see that that temperature has, has increased. Uh, over time. We're in the middle of analyzing it. We want to understand it better, but um, it's possible that this is uh, an epidemic that's going to be linked to climate change and that what we're seeing are the canaries in the coal mine, okay? And that uh, as the climate gets warmer and warmer, we may see this more and more creeping up into the United States as, as the southern states get uh, hotter and hotter. So. Uh, certainly, when we talk about environmental disease and environmental killers, climate change, of course, is on all our minds, uh, that the implications of that may be, may be huge uh, going forward. Another, um, so I, I, I always think about this uh, kidney disease epidemic that happened in the Balkans. Um, started in the 50s, people became aware of it in the 50s. It was finally solved in, uh, the, year, in the early 2000s. So 50 years to figure it out. And that's uh, my nightmare. Um, but hopefully we have, we have learned since then. Um, and I should say they, fi they figured it out by luck. I won't go into detail, but it was because some women in a Belgian weight loss clinic took a weight loss supplement that a person who misread the Chinese characters and put the wrong ingredient in it. And that's how they figured it out. <laughs> so we probably won't have that happen uh, to us, but uh, we have lots of research going on. Um, I'm really hopeful that we can uh, figure this out uh, really soon um, because you know, people, people just deserve it. 
Another theme of um, Aaron Brockovich is the role that individuals can play. Someone like Aaron Brockovich, who was not trained as a, a lawyer, but who, through um, her own commitment and, and dedication and um, determination, uh, was able to actually uh, find a, you know find this 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 real problem and uh, as I think it says bring brought a uh, company to its knees. So a group that's been really do, of individuals who are doing this really good work, of individuals who are committed and determined and um, have stayed committed for, for going on 30 years now is the Sister City Project. I became a member in 2001 when I learned about this chronic kidney disease and um, it's, it's been really enriched me as well, so um, it's uh, really wonderful things that they have done um, for and with the, the community of, of Quetzalcoatl, and I hope that you will check them out. As Kathy mentioned, there is a uh, Sister City Week uh, that we're in the middle of, and there is a great uh, fundraiser going on on uh, this Thursday. Here's the information. There's information also out at the uh, at the table um, when you when you leave after the movie. So um, I just wanted to give you a quick, you know, with a short short time. I couldn't go into much detail. I wanted to give you just a quick overview. And um, what I thought that we could do, if we have time, which do we? No, we don't have time. <laughs> I went over. So, all right. So even with uh, even with that short short talk. Um, we, we went over. So um, I will be around after. And if uh, you uh, would like to talk a little bit, I'd be happy to stay and, and enter into discussions because there are so many, so many interesting things. And I learn things from talking to people uh, all the time. So I hope you enjoy the movie. And um, yeah, again, um, think about the connections between that movie and what we have facing us in Central America. Um, finally, uh, these are my grandkids. I thought of putting together, uh, saying something like, you know, all children should have the right to grow up healthy and happy and all of that, but the truth is I just wanted to put them up on a big movie screen. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you.